Can, okay. can I start? Yeah. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you for um, taking your time to uh, talk to us tonight. Um, the the Democrats have been, I mean, you guys talked about it. They're running on on democracy. They're putting democracy on the ballot, right? But then they changed DNC um, primary rules to hurt RFK Jr. And they've spent millions of dollars working to get RFK Jr. to prevent him from getting on the ballot and disenfranchise uh, millions of Americans who support RFK Jr. How, how do the Democrats deal with that? Like with, with, with trying, like do, do you think they have to prevent democracy to save democracy? We're not here to speak for any candidate or party, but, well, do, you, but yeah. do you think there is a tension in the Democratic message? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to you, Amna. I mean, yeah. we, we hear, you know, Trump has also turned this around and said, no, it's Biden who's attacking democracy by ginning up all these prosecutions. Now, of course, there's no evidence that the White House is behind yeah. all the prosecutions. But is there a sense that, you know, the, the democracy issue is a double-edged sword or is tricky in any way? I think one of the reasons I've been surprised to learn that so many people are concerned about preserving democracy, I think it's when you, when you dig into the numbers, it's, yes, it's, it's a lot of Democrats who say we're worried about the erosion of democratic principles if a candidate with anti-democratic tendencies, as we know former President Trump is, were to come into office. It's also a lot of conservatives who say, I'm worried about preserving this democracy that I know and love, and it's changing. And so that kind of means different things to different people. I've heard the criticism. Thank you for your question, by the way. I've heard the, the criticism both around you know, uh, allowing a Kennedy on a debate stage, um, on, on changing some of those rules early on. I, I hear them all the time, specifically from Kennedy supporters in particular. And for you know the Biden campaign, I think, look, they are, they are worried. We've seen that. We've seen a number of social media clips in particular, right, them kind of juxtaposing things that Kennedy has said versus places he's contradicted himself, or things he said that he didn't say, that then they find the clip and they run it out. They're clearly worried about it. Um, I haven't heard them respond specifically to this question on, on whether they think that they are somehow eroding their own democratic principles, because I don't think that they would say that they're excluding him. I think that they would say that this is the way that the, the campaign unfolds, this is the way the process unfolds, and, and, and that's the way we're going to do it. I think there's questions around the debates that have not been fully mm -hmm. answered yet. Mm -hmm. um, and because we're doing it differently this year, we're not going through the commission, the ground rules aren't as transparent and set as they've been in the past. I think we're going to learn a little bit more about that in the weeks ahead, about what those standards are, what the guidelines are that candidates have to meet to make that stage. Um, and I expect some of those questions will be answered. Let's go over here to this microphone. Sir, go ahead. Thanks. On the flanks. Um, so I, I'm not going to bury the lead. I'm wondering what your thoughts are that the Democrat and Republican parties are the latest in a long line of institutions that Americans have lost faith in, and that periodically in history, uh, effectively, there's a falling apart that happens, where there's kind of like an unbundling, like what happened with cable packages, with streaming services, or the gig economy from the, uh, you know, the normal work culture, where enough people have amassed that really don't have faith in either party or either candidate and don't really know what they stand for in a modern context anymore, uh, that maybe the parties have outlived the original context of what they stood for. And I'm wondering if, you know, thinking about a, an obvious example in the last 80 years, FDR, he had to thread the needle between the extremes, the communists and the fascists, and he had to pull together a lot of disengaged people who just dropped out of the system entirely. He had to pull together populists from both parties that had disengaged from their parties. And I'm just wondering if you feel, how you feel that these trends play into the current situation and, and how the parties are affected by that, the existing parties. I think you're, um, you're, you put your finger on something that's really real, which is like both parties are in this moment of, of significant transformation. Um, and we don't totally know where that's going to go. I think in some ways, um, Biden uh, running for a second term sort of arrested that a little bit in the Democratic Party. But that debate is going to happen. Like Biden can't, he's not going to run for, if he wins, he's not going to run again. So there'll be a very open debate in the Democratic primary in the next election where I think you'll see a lot of long held posi positions, like for example, Israel, like we were talking early in the support for Israel. Uh, reconsidered by the party and that'll be hashed out like in basically in the 
if Biden wins again, in that second term of his administration, and certainly once they get into the uh, primary and once they get into that next presidential election, which if Biden wins will happen like the next day, right? Everyone will start running uh, for president. There's a backlog Absolutely. of a bench there. So I, I, think, um, I think you'll definitely see that. Now where that ends up, I don't know, but that, that clearly that is a party on the, you know, in the middle of like this period of train, uh, change, and we've definitely seen that in the Republican Party. Like Trump transformed that party I mean, uh, uh, traditional Republican pillars like, you know, support for free trade or even, you know, when you're talking about Ukraine, those things have all been remade. And he's doing it now, perhaps with abortion. Right. And so that party has also been really changed over uh, like the Trump sort of era. And I think if Trump, you know, these are not young men. Right. They can't do this at some point. They can't do this anymore. Uh, So, you know, and so it'll be the same kind of thing, I think, in some way with Trump. We don't know what a post-Trump Republican Party looks like, but it's not going to look like the pre-Trump Republican Party. So I don't like, uh, one thing I've learned in this job is you are you are really not in the prediction business. And if you get in that business, you uh, are doing something wrong and you are probably getting it wrong. Um, so I can't tell you where it's going to go. But I do think you're right that we are in a moment of like really significant political reshuffling and change for both parties. Well, well, yeah, and I, I was going to add no. to that. I mean, I feel like um, because we are looking at this rematch, right, of, of these two white men of a certain age, what you do have uh, is really voters thinking more about their power than, than the power that they are that they are giving somebody by electing them. It's not about for them e- e- even one particular candidate, but it is about the, the power that they have to shape this democracy. And so it is not just about election day; it is about holding people accountable beyond election day. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, watching people as they govern, uh, you know, the people that, that they are putting into into these roles. But um, they, uh, so many voters, I think, you know, in, in uh, both parties are really thinking about how can I be valued, not just for my output, but also for my input. Well, we consistently see in polls that voters wish they had more options. Always. Voters yeah. wish, and, and people have been disaffiliating from the two major parties. Mm-hmm. So why hasn't there been a, a flourishing third party movement of some sort in this country? Is it just that that disaffection doesn't have a sort of policy valence to it on all those people who don't like the major parties all want different things? I mean, there was this effort to have a, a no labels candidate this mm-hmm. cycle and it sort of fell apart because nobody wanted to do it. <laughs> right. uh, but that was an attempt to say, you know, the two parties are too extreme and we need a sort of a, 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 a third way, an option in the middle. Uh, is it just that the, the two parties have such a, a, a lock on the process that they're able to, to sort of monopolistically shut everybody else out? Where, why do you think it hasn't happened? I think it's really hard to start a viable third party. Mm-hmm. It's just hard for the process reasons you're talking about, even the logistical reasons of getting on the ballot. I think right. voting, you know, people sort of vote historically, right? Like they, it's hard to break those patterns that people have over, uh, you know, their years of their voting life. It's um, so I just think it's a hard and it's expensive, right? Mm-hmm. It's really yes. expensive, and so it's a hard, like very expensive thing to start. Let's go to this microphone right here, sir, please. Right. Um, in, in response to the conversation about where things are polling with Americans and what's important to them, what subjects and what matters to them mostly, in response to um, that particular concern with the erosion of freedom, um, I, I've res- recently read on the Hill is reported as well as multiple legal papers have reported um, a preliminary win for Kennedy against Biden regarding the uh, subversion of his First Amendment rights where he was removed from multiple social media platforms. And um, as, as First Amendment rights not only include um, our ability to speak but also our ability to know. I want to know how you feel about your news groups in that none of you have reported this recent win by Kennedy against Biden on this injunction that uh, where he, the decision by Dowdy has decided that his uh, right of free speech has been infringed upon. Well, I can't speak to that particular 
issue that you're raising because I haven't I haven't covered it. But I can tell you that we at the New York Times have a full time reporter on the Kennedy campaign. We write a lot about that campaign. Um, she attends a lot of the events. We're taking him very. I mean, for us to assign somebody to a candidate, it's like we are taking that campaign seriously and we're watching that um, as a really like influential piece of this election. So. I, I don't, I must admit, I don't know this, this specific issue, but I can say like, you know, that's not traditional for us, for a non, um, for like a non, uh, for a third party candidate. Like often we have someone who sort of keeps an eye on a bunch of, you know, if there's a couple, we keep an eye on a couple of them. And we certainly um, don't always have someone on the third party candidates this early in the race, but this year we do. And I think it is a testament to how influential we think Kennedy can be in this race. I think there's another interesting aspect to this campaign, which is just how unsettled the uh, information environment is, right? Yeah. I mean, this is really the first presidential campaign since the rise of TikTok, which according to Pew, as many as a third of voters under 30 are primarily getting their news from TikTok, mm -hmm. uh, which you know the, the, the Senate and House of Representatives believe is a national security threat, mm -hmm. and they're, they're going to, to ban it after the election if it's not sold off. I mean, uh, how much of an influence do you think it has just the fact that it's so splintered where people are getting their news and, and we can't necessarily trust that the things that we report and know are true are sort of getting through to people out there in the electorate? Yeah, I, I feel like that is becoming increasingly important, but I will take us uh, into the way back machine to 2016 when Russia was directly targeting black women voters in particular because of the influential uh, and, and reliable voting bloc that, that they were then. Uh, targeting them on social media specifically, right? So targeting voters of color on social media who we know disproportionately use social, get their information from social media uh, is, is not something that's new, but it is something that is, has spread because it has been effective. I think in the pandemic, we definitely saw how mis and disinformation, especially on social media platforms, was effective. I think you have to talk about AI and the role of AI. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in, in 2024, which is which is unprecedented and is, is going to play a role. It's something that um, certainly I think we as, as a, a political press have to be concerned about. I, I think it is something that these campaigns are, are um, concerned about and, and um, are, are monitoring uh, because that does have the potential. We, you know, if voters d don't know the difference between what it is that, you know, folks like us are doing and, and um, really the much more sophisticated misinformation, right? I mean, this is not Hillary Clinton's alien baby in the National Enquirer at the checkout line, right? Like this is, this Wait, is- are you uh, saying that wasn't true? Apparently, <laughs> Tur turns out, fact check. No, no, there was no alien baby. But, but, uh, but yeah, but I mean, it, 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 the good news is, you know, you have a lot of people that are much more interested in politics and seeking out information. Uh, the bad news is, you know, what they're getting is not, uh, you know, always factual and, and so, um, Trusted sources of information are more important than ever, but also, yeah, uh, that is a very, uh, very perilous terrain for folks that are seeking that out. Thank you so much for your question. Do we have another? Go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. You mentioned earlier that you've spoken to voters who are apparently afraid for their physical safety mm -hmm. in the wake of the election, presumably because of civil unrest. And I'd like you to address, if you would, the role of the media in fomenting those views. I heard on public radio today, I heard Trump for the, I don't know, 13th time uh, being compared to Hitler. Um, I hear all the time that this election is, could mean the end of democracy, that we wouldn't, I think it was mentioned tonight, that it may be the last time we'll be able to vote in an election. If the media is going to continue to hype this idea that we are facing an existential threat in this election, and I, the media I listen to, because I'm a Democrat, they're obviously saying don't vote for Trump, vote for Biden, but I presume the same thing is going on on, on the right. Um, <clears throat> wouldn't a third party candidate who can be a reconciliation candidate be a possible way to resolve that, what you're describing as a very real and dangerous concern where you have approximately half the electorate not accepting the, the person who wins? Thank I do you. think that there, there is a, thank you for that question. I, it, we do spend so much time talking about the sort of extremes in our politics and there are so many voters who are going about their lives and for whom everything is normal and fine. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I just, 
went to a college campus for a story on the students who, who aren't out there protesting, which is approximately 90% of college sure, students, right? right? And 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 they feel similarly to you that there's all the there's all this, you know, noise and yelling and extremes all around them, and they would just like there to be a quiet place where they can talk and nobody yells at them. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I do yeah, think what do you think about this that? is being driven by the candidates, Hello. right? It is Biden who is getting up there and saying democracy is under siege and this election is an existential choice. It is Trump who is getting there getting up there and saying, you know, the deep state is coming for me, the entire government is broken, we need to like blow up the system, right? Th this, the candidates are driving this. And I, it's interesting because I did a piece on, um, you know, it's also like there's a lot of data showing that political violence is up, mm -hmm. right? Like members of Congress have more security, get more threats than they have in like anyone can remember, right? The FBI have puts out all these various warnings about increase in sort of hate groups and um, like militia groups within the country, like those things are sort of a, a, are quantitative measures that are happening in the country. So I think some of those fears um, are grounded in what people are seeing. And it's interesting because I did a piece on political violence in 2021, right? So that was after Biden. And one of the things we looked at was just how the rhetoric had changed, how you have candidates getting up there and talking about tyranny and um, using phrasing that we just didn't hear, you know, mm -hmm. 10 years ago or whatever. And um, so I do think these concerns are coming, first of all, they're being, the candidates are reflecting um, what is a real concern that people have. I mean, you look at even that movie Civil War, right? Like that, that did Blockbuster, like it topped the box mm -hmm. office for multiple weeks, which mm -hmm. is not really what happens to that kind of, it was sort of more of an art house. It wasn't a Marvel movie, right? That's true. Yeah, and um, I think that's reflecting something that's in the, that's in the culture, you know? Uh, well, I mean, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I mean, January 6th was in the culture. Right, and, and, January 6th And, and, and the media the didn't do that. Yeah. Right. Uh, the insurrection happened. That was a thing that, that happened in our democracy, right? So like the threat of political violence is real. Uh, that was something that we did not think that we were going to see as a democracy. Um, and so where do we go, you know, in the first election since the insurrection? Like that's a real question that, that people have that is coming from a real place because that was the thing that we actually experienced. Not to mention um, the threat of political violence against poll workers. Like that is not a thing that was happening before. Like people, the, the, the lovely people that help us facilitate free and fair and safe elections are now saying, this is not what I signed up for. Like that is not like a thing that we are perpetuating. That is a thing that is real, that is happening. Um, you know, I, it, it, folk, folks who are, are thinking about running for office but do not want to because their spouse mm -hmm. could be attacked or because um, they might be part of a, a you know, the, the target of a kidnapping plot. Like these are things that are happening. Or even the threats, frankly, that we get in the media. I mean, well, the, the security. You're not even going to get to that. We won't yeah. go make it about us, but yes, also well, that. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> yes. I mean, our security apparatus has grown exponentially yeah. at the pace. We're just about out say, of time. I want to well, do... Can I just say one thing yeah. about that? Because I think it's important in, in response to the question that was asked, and thank you for that. I, I do think all of us up here, all of our colleagues I know as well, take our responsibility very seriously to add light and not heat to these conversations. Mm -hmm. But this goes back to the question of where people get their information. If you are watching breathless media that only focuses on the protests that get violent or only focuses on moments of political violence and doesn't focus like we do in a lot of cases on local stories on the ground where a lot of these divisions that play out at the national level are not as acute, then I suggest you change news sources as well. But the concern, I think, that undergirds a lot of our reporting around political violence is based on the data and it is based on historical trends. And, and it's really the is. idea that even in the time leading up to the Civil War, even through the Civil War, even in the time of white and state violence against civil rights activists in the 50s and 60s, we never had someone try to stop the peaceful transfer of power through political violence, and we have now had that. And this is something that happens in democracies in decline around the world, and it has now happened here, and it's happening here. 
and the numbers show the people are more prone, they have a greater proclivity for political violence on both sides of the partisan divide. 40% mm -hmm. of election workers or elected officials have received some kind of threats in some case. The threats are worse for women and people of color. I was talking to two secretaries of state earlier today mm -hmm. who have go bags in their homes because one had an armed man show up at her home with her and her child inside. Another has gotten so many threats, he may need to change locations. I mean, this is, this is a new point in history for our country. And I, and I think, I hope you know, and I hope everyone here watching at home knows that we take our responsibility to cover it responsibly but accurately very, very seriously. We're just about out of time. Uh, let's hear both of these questions and we'll do a quick lightning round and then, and then we'll wrap up. I don't want to end on that dark a note. Sorry, but, yeah. uh, <laughs>